Romans chapter number 16. Begin reading in verse number 17. The Apostle Paul writes, Now I beseech you, brethren, march, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they, are th for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good works and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Now, church at Rome, his letter was delivered by Phoebe. Okay, and I mean, you can read the undertext at the end of this chapter, written of the Romans from Corinthians, sent by Phoebe. Right, the one who wrote it, you can go down to verse number 22. Tertius wrote the epistle for the Apostle Paul. Okay, there's a long history of people in this chapter. You all ought to be thankful that I'm not doing a teens class on you and make you all pronounce some of the names in this chapter. Okay, but this is a long, starting in verse number 1, all the way down to verse number 15. He's talking about those that they ought to greet, who they ought to salute, those that aren't able to come to them, but want to say that they love them, that they've been praying for them, that they appreciate them. Those that have been kind to the Apostle Paul. I believe he was staying in Gaius' house at this point. Yeah, verse number 23, Gaius, mine host, and with the whole church, salute you. The whole church where? At Corinth. Okay, he said, there's been a lot of people that have helped me since the last time I saw y'all. He says, there's been a lot of people that you may know or that you haven't met yet, but they're on their way to meet you. And I want you all to know that they're the right stock. Right? They love God. They want to be used to God. They want to do something that would bring honor and glory under the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, and then, as he gets done mentioning all them people, okay, we get to verse number 17. Now I beseech you, therefore, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. Okay, he doesn't say mark them that rub you the wrong way. He doesn't say mark them that you've got a problem with the way that they laugh or the way that, you know. There are just some people, if you're like me, there's some people, you hear their voice and you want to just like bang your head into the wall. Right? That's your first instinct. Anybody else? Yeah. Thad's shaking his head, so at least I got the treasure on my side. Okay? But there are just some people that they just rub you the wrong way. Now, if we're being honest, nine times out of ten, the problem's with us, not with them. He doesn't say mark those that are contrary to you. He says, mark those that are contrary to the doctrine which ye have received. He doesn't say, mark those that you don't like the way that they worship. He doesn't say, mark those that you don't like the way that when they testify, you can't understand anything that they're saying because they're just crying the whole time. All right? Well, that testimony wasn't for you, it was for God. Be quiet. If you got a problem with it, I'll throw a shoe at you. Right? If God's in it, that's all that matters which is the doctrine which we have received. Right? What was the doctrine of those that would worship him? It was supposed to be in spirit and in truth. Jesus told the woman at the well, now, and he said the time is coming, and now is that those that worship God will worship him in spirit and in truth. Right? How else are we supposed to conduct the affairs of God around the church of God? Well, first, God gave an under-shepherd to pastor. Right? Pastoral authority means that he's the leader of the church. Okay, yes, the church voted him in, but when the church voted him in, they said that we believe that's the man of God that God wants at this church. After that, so long as he's following the Bible and doing his best to follow after God, it's our job to get behind him, support him, and follow after him. Right? Just because he preached a message that you know, came and sat in my lap the whole time, right? one, he doesn't know that. He's preaching what God told him to preach. How do you know that? Because I've had people come up and say, that devotion was just what I need. I didn't know that. Right? I wrote that on my lunch break. 
right? Or God gave me that verse a week ago, and I wrote that down then, and it happened to you after that point. Right? I've had people say, well, hey, that Sunday school is just what I need. I didn't know that. I just got in the book and said, Lord, I need something for your people. Try and teach them something. And then by His grace, He supplied it. Right? So whether we agree with what we receive from the under-shepherd, irregardless of the fact that the doctrine that we've received is to follow Him. Right? I can tell you this. Right? We don't see all the time that He spends just trying to get the mind of God and get enough of him out of himself to where he can follow after God the way that God would want him to follow after him. So instead of looking at what we didn't agree with, it, well, Lord, why do I have a problem with that? Lord, is the problem with me? Or is the problem with the way that I'm living? Is it just because I was in a bad mood that day? Right, anybody ever come to church in a bad mood? Yeah. Oh, point, we are very quick and judgmental to, and I'm as guilty of it as anybody. If I burn a bridge, that sucker's burnt. Can't rebuild that bridge. Right? I say you can't. It, it'd take an act of God to do it. But that's just the way that in my head that makes sense. If I'm done with something, I'm done with them. Right? That's not what the Bible says. Right? I've wrestled a whole lot with. Well, Lord, it'd just be it'd be easier to avoid it, right? Yeah, they, they did me wrong. I'm okay. I'm past that. I just don't want to see them ever again. Right? Bridge is burned. Yeah, they hurt me. They may have never apologized. Doesn't matter. The Bible says I'm supposed to forgive them. Fact. Because see, this is why it doesn't say mark those that cause divisions or offenses to you because the Bible tells me that if I know that there's a problem between me and somebody else I'm supposed to go and resolve it whether I'm the guilty party or not if I know it I'm supposed to go because see if I were marking those that were contrary or causing divisions to the doctor that I've received, I'd have to count myself. Because what? You know, the mentality that we have, if it's against the Bible, we're contrary to what God wants. So, why are we talking about all this? Because in verse number 17, he's talking about those that outwardly, publicly, make a stand against the church. Okay, they tried to keep in mind this is a time where they actually knew what persecution was they experienced it okay, how many books of your New Testament did the Apostle Paul write from behind jail cells or jail bars or in captivity right, there was time when he was in Rome where he had his own house but he was still a prisoner of the centurion that provided in the house he was not a free man for most of his you know, lighter half of his life. In fact, I think it was... Was he here? Yeah, verse number four. He says, Who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. He's saying that Priscilla and Aquila, he said, they've entered into harm's way with me. They've said, we're going to follow after the man of God, even if it kills me even if others kill me, even if I have to die a horrible death. Right? Back then, they weren't too good on mercy. Right? They were pretty good at the cruel and unusual kind of punishment to make examples out of people. They said, we'll lay our own necks down on the line for the cause of Christ. There were people that were contrary to them that tried to cause divisions to split the church up. Those people are still around today. Don't get me wrong. But the Apostle Paul is saying, be on guard, watch for those people. But if we really sit down and we think, you know, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church of the living God. The devil can't do anything to God's church unless God's people let him. God's people are following after and doing what God wants to. 
Church is going to flourish. Church is going to be fine. God will take care of his own people. Not saying hard times won't come, but those hard times cannot prevail against the church of the living God. In fact, study your Bible. In the New Testament, every time after Jesus started the church, every time there was persecution, the church grew out of the persecution. It expanded. Read the book of Acts. Every time that the world tried to shut the apostles up and the church up, what happened? God just show up and do something that nobody else could explain, and that's how they knew God did it. But see, here he's talking about outward threats, but it also applies to inward threats. It says, Mark those that first cause divisions. We've talked a lot about contrary to doctrine. What's a division? Just separation. A little bit of space. Okay, it's been a while since I've taken a math class, but it doesn't matter if you divide 10 by 2 or you divide 10 by 4, it's still a division. You've broken it into a smaller piece. Right, anybody ever hear that little leaven, leaven at the whole lump? Right? What's good for the goose is good for the gander. That's how rednecks might say it. What are we saying? A little division is still division. Anything less than 100% is not all. Any division is a chance for the world, for carnal man. We're going to get to that here in a second. For wolves in sheep's clothing to get in just a little space and with a little space you can cause a whole lot of division right brother Ray good to see you brother but you can go out there and see where brother Ray's had to fix some of the divisions in the parking lot that used to be one solid piece of blacktop and what happened things shifted snow came and then snow melted and a little bit of water got down in there in between them pieces of blacktop caused a big division. I don't know why. How many times you filled in that one sinkhole right over here by the handicap spots, by the old building? That sucker just keeps going down. Yeah. It's a swamp in that one spot. Don't understand why. But I've thought about that before. I can't wrap my head around it. Okay? So I gave up. But all throughout the parking lot, what happened? Things shifted. In a little space, over time, that Brother Ray's got better things to do than to go out there with a microscope every day and look for itty-bitty cracks and then fill them with tar. Right? We're not paying Regler or whoever to come out here and resurface the thing after every Sunday service. Right? You say, well, that'd be a way to avoid a crack. But see, some cracks, they're not divisions. Okay, for instance, Jan wasn't on. Last week, right about there, I got me a good paper cut. It's gone now. That wasn't a division. Right? That might have been a crack. Might have been a cut. But my finger was still attached to me. That wasn't a division. Now, if... I would have taken that and then gone and rubbed it in some manure or something and it get gangrene, that would have been a division. Why? Because the finger had to come off to save the rest of the body. Right? There are certain things that we think, oh my gosh, this is going to cause a whole lot of problems. Well, are we just overreacting? Are we making mountains out of molehills? Do I think it's a huge problem and the problem's with me? Is it really a division? Because cracks can be fixed long before they become a problem. But if, God forbid, one of y'all were to go through a drive through and hit one of them big yellow concrete poles and chip your paint. But that's not a problem. I mean, depending on how retentive you are about your car and it being pristine, it may be a huge problem. But a tiny scratch, even in the clear coat, you may not be able to see it. That's not a problem right now. But after the salt from winter, after the humidity of 
you know, the Florida weather we've had, been, you know, going on around here lately. Although Friday, Friday I felt pretty good. I walked out of work. I was like, hey, it is a great day. I didn't expect that. But that little clear coat, what's the clear coat there for? To protect the paint. Why is the paint there? Well, the paint's there to make it look good, but also to keep the unfinished steel underneath from rusting. If your clear coat's fine, don't have to worry about rusting so long as the under part of your car's fine too. But anyway, that's a whole different story. But that little thing, that wasn't a problem, it can be a whole big problem. You know the only way to get rid of rust? Cut it out. Or to sandblast all of it off. You gotta get it out completely. Just like that root of bitterness that the Bible talks about. It takes an act of God to reach down and pull out the roots of bitterness in our hearts. Well, th those things that can cause division aren't always necessarily a problem right now. We can address it. It's not a division. Okay, maybe there's a bigger problem for me to worry about right now than the cuts and scrapes that I've got. God will deal with them later. Right? There's so much going on in the world, if we looked at all the things that could be problems, we'd never get anything done. He's not talking about things that could be. But that's the boy that cried wolf, except in this scenario, the, bull, the boy's got a you know, huge set of binoculars and he can see a wolf 10 miles away. Well, if it gets any closer, we'll deal with it. But right now, we got more important. We can't just stand here looking at the wolf. Right? We got water to get. We got food to get. We got jobs to work. We got families to provide for. We've got a city to run. We don't have time to sit over here and watch this wolf. That may never come this way. Okay, there are things that could be problems. What are those? That's life. Here he's talking about divisions, problems things that divide, that separate God's people. They say, mark those things. I mean, I could stand up here all day long and tell you all the things that could be a problem. But see, I'm not God. You aren't either. I don't know what the rest of the today holds, let alone tomorrow. I can tell you what could be a problem, but you know who else can do that? The Holy Ghost. It's not the pastor's job it's not Sunday school teacher's job. It's not your friend's job. It's not your spouse's job to tell you what could be a problem for you. That's your job. The Holy Ghost lives and dwells inside those that are saved to lead and guide us into all truth. If we desire to know, Lord, what do I need to be cautious of? He'll reveal it to us. And the thing is, is that because God is the way that God is and He's gracious and merciful, if we do our best to put on the whole armor of God, right? God's righteousness isn't going to fail us. Certainly faith in God won't fail us. Right? Peace will never fail us. Truth will never fail us. Those things which we put our faith in God, because God said these things going to be able to shield you from a lot of hurt and a lot of harm. Right? If I do my best to put that armor on, to maintain it, to make sure that I'm ready as a soldier of God, God does this thing where because He's omnipotent and He's all-knowing, because He's omnipresent, He's everywhere at once, those things that are too much for me, he takes care of. But Lord, that could be a problem. Yeah. But if you focus on what you can handle, I'll take care of that. He may never say that. But that's what He promises to do in your Bible. You may never have a moment where God comes down and says, Hey, stop worrying about it. Just handle what you can handle. Right? You may not have that you know, clear defining moment where you're caught up on the mountain. Right? Nobody's having that because visions are done. According to your Bible, not my opinion. But you may never have that still 
moment where it finally clicks in your head oh I don't have to worry about that duh but if you just do what you can do because God knows that if we were worried about all the things that could go wrong or what could harm us or what could be a problem for our family or what could be a problem for our church we'd never get anything done and we'd all be so over medicated to function that we'd be like a bunch of zombies everybody have ulcers everybody have panic attacks right that's not the life that Christ promised his believers he said that he came to give us life life more abundantly and then he promised that the fruits of the spirit love joy peace peace is what God intends in the life of his children didn't say that there wouldn't be struggle but in the midst of your struggle you've got peace didn't say that there wouldn't be conflict but in the middle of that conflict in your soul there's peace that you're doing what God wants you to do doesn't mean that you won't have to stand and look at a whole lot of people that in their eyes it says we want to destroy you and they're marching right towards you but if you're right where God wants you to be that peace you're going to stay there nothing's going to be able to move you why? Because God said, that's where you need to be. This is where I'm going to be. Until God tells me to be somewhere else. What are we saying? All the things that could be problems, don't mark those. If you marked everything that could be a division, one, you'd run out of paper, and two, you wouldn't be doing much sleeping, because there's a whole lot of them. And marking all those things, that's a tactic of the devil. Fear, doubt, worry. Looking at things that we cannot control, trying to anticipate what will come. If all you're worried about is what could be, you're not focused on what God wants you to do. Why? Because today is the day that the Lord hath made. Tomorrow, if it comes, I've got plans on what I'm going to do tomorrow but they're not so set in stone that if God said go do something else I wouldn't go do something else but tomorrow will take care of tomorrow I know what God at least for you know the next 15-20 minutes I know what God wants me to do finish the Sunday school lesson well what am I doing after that well it's the appointed time that God's people come out and worship Him I'm planning on doing that but see, Brother John, just because I plan on worshiping and singing in court, God could walk through here, whole thing get, you know, too foggy around here for us. Big preacher show up, be no singing. Right? Be no preaching. God's people just be in the altar. That'd be fine with me. Wouldn't upset my apple cart. Right? I could it'd be fine with me if we didn't get to finish the rest of the Sunday school lesson. But what do we say? There are things that if we spend all of our time marking what could be a problem, we'll never do what God wants us to do now. In order to pay attention to all the things that could be, we have to forget about what is right now. The only thing that we have power over is what we can do right now. The only, truly, the only thing that I ever have control over is what I do, not what other people do. So when divisions do arise, mark those that cause them. God's able to fix a division. Especially if God's people have the right mindset, have the right heart. That hey, don't know how it happened, but God didn't, doesn't want it to stay around. Let's mend this thing. Right? Let's bear one another's up. Let's edify them. Build them up. Right? Let's love on people. Right? Let's be godly toward God's people. Let's mend, you know, stand in the hedge, make up a gap, mend the division. But once it happens, if the one that caused the division, I mean, once everything's made right, if the one that caused the division doesn't want to get things made right, mark that person. Mark somebody that's always going around and gossiping around the house of God trying to plant seeds of division. That's not what could be. That person's doing it. Right now again, that's not necessarily all of our jobs. That's the pastor's job. He the under-shepherd. He's got those that he's put, you know, 
by the leading of God and those that have said, hey, I believe that's what God wants me to do. There are people around here that the pastor tells them, hey, if anything's going on, keep your ears open. Right, if you hear something, you've heard it said. They don't come talk to the people that they know they're going to go down the hall and say, hey, let's go talk to Brother Doug about this. Right? Look at verse number 18. Right? That with their end of the verse, by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. They don't go after the well rooted Christians, they go after the young Christians, they go after immature Christians that have never de developed their spirituality. They go after the susceptible. Because if you can get an in, just a little space to cause a division, that crack can get real big if it goes unnoticed. They go after those that may not have a good understanding of the Bible. Now, if they're new Christians, that's not their fault. But if they've been saved a while, they've been sitting under the preacher around here for a while, they ought to know. And they know that they ought to be given to study and the reading of their Bible so that they do know what the Word of God says. But even if you haven't been around long enough, hopefully you've got enough common sense that if somebody says, hey, you know this, that, and the other, I don't know about that. Let's go ask Brother Doug. Got to shut that up real quick. I promise you that. Right, as much as I would want to, I know that they don't come to me because I'd do that. A part of me would say, well, hang on a second. Let's really break down the logic that you're uh, working on here. And let me show you all these reasons that you're wrong. That wouldn't accomplish anything. They're just going to go to somebody else and try to do the same thing. You want to know what really will quench it? God. But God's people got to be aware of it. So mark divisions and those that cause them. But also mark those, as we've already talked about, that offend and cause divisions to the doctrines that we've received right, that goes against this okay, why? well because of verse number 18 they are so, such for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly now, I mean, just a simple thought right here as I was reading this doesn't say that they're not sons of God. They may very well be saved, Brother Aaron. doesn't say that they're lost. It just says that they don't serve Jesus. Now, I don't know about you. There have been many a day since I've been saved that that day I didn't serve Jesus. I may very well have been the one that this verse talks about that I needed to vent. I get that. Every now and then I just need to vent. I've learned that if I write it out and then delete it, it's just better to get it off my chest, right? But used to, I had to go tell, like I, I was going to explode, I had to go say something. Right? May not have meant anything that I said, I just needed to get them thoughts out of my head so I'd stop thinking about them. Anybody ever been there before? But here's the problem. You talk to the wrong person, that can cause a division. It can give them occasion because... I may not have been it. May have explained it. Hey, I just need to get this off my chest. I don't want to do any of this. That's why I want to get it off my chest. Because right? the longer I hold it in, the more I'm going to keep thinking about that, and the less I'm going to be able to think about what I really need to do. Right? Anybody ever picked the wrong person to confide in before? Well, if you vent to the wrong person, that may be the occasion that allows division to come in. Not because we intended to do it, but because somebody with ulterior motives found a crack and they're going to push against it to see if it'll crack. See if it'll open up into a division. What do you say? Well, one, it's always great to have good godly friends that you can just talk to if you need to. You know that they're not going to judge you. That if you ask them to just shut up, they're not going to try and give you the... I know the Bible and why I shouldn't do all these things. I just need to say it to get it out of my head so that I don't do it. I just got to vent. Right? I've tried telling God and God just keeps telling me that, hey, I should let it go. So I'm going to try and let it go. But I just need somebody to listen that's not going to care what I say. Just say, 
hey, glad you got it off your chest. Pat me on the back and then let me go. That's just the way that I am. I don't need to have a Dr. Phil powwow where we bring everybody in and we say, now, how do you feel about this? I don't care. Shut up. I just need to get it off of my chest. That's how I work. You say, it's not healthy. I don't care. It's worked so far. What's the point? Anything could be a problem if we do it the wrong way. Now, obviously, the one occasion that I'm thinking of, if I'd have been more mature, I'd have been able to come to an altar and lay it down there. Now, there's always ways we can do it better. But our desire should be to do it in a way that doesn't bring shame or reproach against the name of Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter how I feel, I should be able to bear it if it means that until I get to church the next time to lay it down on the altar or until I can get back to my prayer closet or until my lunch break where I can sit and talk to God in my car for a second right? I can bear the reproach against me long enough that it doesn't bring reproach against Him because we may be the one that inadvertently, unintentionally opens up a division or does something contrary to what we know is right in the Bible and as a result of it, it brings shame and reproach against the church and against our Savior. There's somebody that's always doing that. The Apostle Paul says to mark them. Why do we mark these things? Hopefully so that we can address it and fix it. Make everything one again. If you see somebody going through it that it always seems like, hey, I just keep hearing that they're having a rough time of it. Don't mark them and put a bullseye on them. Mark them as somebody that, hey, I need to send them a text. I need to be good. To, I want to invite them out to dinner one night. I just want to be good to them, not hoping to get anything out of it. I just know they're going through a rough time. I want to let them know that God's people care about them. Put feet on your own prayers. Go to them. Why? Because if we edify, if we exhort, Something that could be a problem may never be a problem. Because hopefully, in my mind, if anybody ever sees me going around a bend too quick for a, you know, locomotive engine, hey, you're going too fast for that curve up there. How do you know that? Because I wrecked there one time. Slow down. Right? Somebody just out of the goodness, hey, take it easy. Right, come over here, just. just Get away to a desert place for about 45 minutes. Cool down. Just chill. And then we'll get you back in the engineer compartment. Conductor seat. You can do whatever you want to. Because that's one of the dangers of life. Everything going, 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 going. You've got so many plates in the air. So many balls you're trying to juggle. Right? So many thoughts going through your head that if one drops, the devil may use it as occasion to cause a division in your life. Well, the problem is, is that division in the heart of one, we're fitly framed together, that's a division in the church. What did that Shunammite woman say on why she wasn't worthy to, not Shunammite, Samaritan woman, say to Solomon, over in the Song of Solomon, on why she wasn't someone to be desired? She says she's kept the vineyards of her brothers and sisters, but her own vineyard she had not kept. The best thing we can do to avoid divisions is to make sure that in our heart, in our, our life, our vineyard, that God's in control and that there's no division between me and Him. Because if every believer sought to do that, then the church as a whole, there'd be no divisions. And if the church as a whole had no division, imagine what we'd be able to do in the community. To date, I haven't heard, you know, because me being me and being curious, when our pastor says things like, there's never been a recorded account of one church that was totally sold out to the cause of Christ. Totally in unity, totally committed to following after the Holy Ghost with everything that they had. Part of my brain says, all right, let's go look for one. Why? Because I want to see if churches did, you know, if churches were used of God to do great things and they weren't, 
100% sold out. I start looking at some of the revivals throughout history, and that church wasn't all the way in. Imagine what God could do if we all did get in. But he's right. No recorded account of one church totally committed to the cause of Christ. You say, that's a hard thing to do. Yeah, i got to wrestle with me every day. And sometimes the me that's in me, he's stronger than I remember him being. And we've got to have a little bit of wrestling match and deal with, you know, Scripture through prayer. i got to do a little bit of work and nail that sucker back down. Some days I get in a rush and I might forget to. That's going to be a rough day. Sometimes there's rough days if all I have to do is deal with what's happening around me. It's a really bad day if i got to deal with that plus what's going on inside me. I'm divided. And if I'm not careful, I can do something to hurt the cause of Christ. It goes on to say in verse number 19, For your obedience has come abroad unto all... Men. What's that saying? He's saying the church at Rome has a reputation of being obedient to the things of God. Your testimony has spread far and wide that in the midst of Rome, a pagan, idolatrous, wicked city, that there were a group of people that wanted to just follow after the things of God. That they were purposed to be obedient and that no divisions would come. If there were divisions, he would write, hey, y'all got some divisions that you got to fix. He's saying right now, y'all have a reputation of being faithful, committed, and purposed to do what God wants you to do. He says, so be on the lookout for things that start causing division. Fix them. Mark within yourselves if you've got a division in your heart between you and God. Because if you've got a division in your heart that keeps you from doing something after God, you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. He said that his followers were those that were obedient to do his commandments. He said that his friends, but when man wants friends, he must show himself friendly. But he said that his friends would be the ones that laid down their life for the cause that he started. Not those that would die, but those that would pick up a cross and say, the old me stuck on this cross. And the new creature within me is doing my best to follow after Christ. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. My friend literally laid down his life on a cross for me. But figuratively, he says, would you be enough of a friend to me to lay down your old life and pick up the new? And when I'm divided, I pick up neither. Both are by the wayside. A little division, still a division. Little doubt is still enough to cause you not to act. Little unbelief may cause all of your faith to shrivel away. But he's saying, he's saying be on the lookout. Thankfully, as I think we heard about, I thought it was Sunday night, might have been dad during tag team. He is our high tower. He sees everything so that we don't have to. Instead of having to go through and dig through all the corners of my life looking for a problem, thankfully, if truly we seek to know so that we can resolve the problem and get it made right, he said, Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. Lord, is there something in my life that's causing division that you're not happy with? If you truly seek him, you're going to find the answer. He'll say yes, or he'll say no. Why? Because he wants you to get it made right. And if you desire to get it made right, he won't hold the truth from you. We ask and we don't receive because we ask so we can consume it upon our own lust. If our desire is, Lord, I don't want to bring reproach to you, I don't want to be a division in the church, I don't want to cause problems or do anything in my life that would be contrary to what the church stands for, show me if there's a problem. He'll reveal it. If you know that there's aught between you and somebody else, Lord, 
I don't know how to get this thing made right. But your word says that if I know that there's a problem, if there's a division, I ought to go and get it made right. So Lord, by faith, I'm going to step out and I pray that you open the door. I'm going to try and be friendly to them, but Lord, I'm not going to force my way in. I pray that you open the door and you do it the way that you want to do it to get it made right. Lord, I don't want to be contrary to the Spirit around the house of God. Lord, is there something in my life, if there's a desire that I have that I'm holding up before, you know, or putting in front of you in my life? Because he says that he ought to be supreme in our hearts. Without doubt, he should be, but sometimes he's not. Right, that great illustration that we heard last Sunday morning. Some of us got idols. Some of them carry them in our pocket. Some of them are on shelves in our home. Some of them are pictures of people that we hold before God. Right, Lord, is there anything that's come before you in the priorities in my life? Because if there is something in front, of, there's a division there. Worse, there's a contradiction. They've done, you've done something contrary to what God desired. So when people see you put that thing before God and you act serving that first, it speaks contrary to what the house of God stands for. You are a written epistle known and read of all men. Your actions speak a whole lot louder than your words. And the reason that most people scoff at churches nowadays, especially if they've got the gumption to put Baptist on it is because a lot of Baptists have done people wrong over the years. A lot of Baptists did things that were contrary to what God intended the church to be. So now when they hear that word, they see in their mind all the things that people who were supposedly Baptists have done that go against what a church should stand for. Now, some people got unrealistic expectations of what churches should be. But everybody knows the church should be good to people. That the house of God is a house of love, it's a house of praise, it's a house of worship. But if we're contrary to those things, when people come in, they're not going to find love and praise and worship. They're going to find division, and they're going to see something that they don't want in their life, and they're going to run from it. If our life is contrary to what the church stands for, why would anybody want to listen and come with us? to the place that we say we learned all of that at. Divisions. The things that are contrary to the doctrines of the Bible, they're not just things that happen to the church. They can happen in the church. They're not things that happen to other people. They can happen to us people. And the danger in both is that we make the gospel, we make the word of none effect to those that hear it. They're too busy looking at our life and all the things wrong with it, and they're not going to receive what we say. Because the Word ought to be delivered by those that are Christ-like. Hey, you can find a lot wrong with me, but you won't find anything wrong with Him. You know when people actually listen to that? When your life points and shows that Jesus is the most important thing in it. But they really believe it. Let's go see what they really are talking about. Well, they think that Jesus is pretty special. Let's go see why. But if everything in your life says that Jesus is a second or a third or who knows how far down the list priority, why would they think that Jesus is special? Because your life doesn't say that Jesus is special. We can get them things resolved by getting those contradictions out of our own heart, those divisions out of our own heart. Then collectively as a church praying, Lord, give us one mind. Let's be in one accord. Let us dwell together in unity because we know that that's your desire. Lord, if there's a division, reveal it to me and I'll do my best to go and get it made right. Lord, if there's something that's contrary, right, we'll mark it. And it'll either get made right or somebody's going to get gone. That's what it boils down to. If you're not in, then why are you here? Right, we're busy about the Lord's business. 
And then if the church is that way, imagine the impact that we could have. I mean, we're getting ready to launch out into a new drawings are over there. That's a drop in the bucket for what God wants to do. You know, that's one grain of sand on the seashore for what God could do. It's those moments where we sit and we kind of roll back on our heels and we say, wow, lots really happened. True, the Bible says set up markers to show when God did something great in the past so that we could take the next generation and go show them, hey, this is where God did something great. He said set up them pillars as memorials to the grace of God, to the power of God, to the work of God. But nowhere in there does it say that we're supposed to stop and look at the pillar instead of keep on going. God's got another thing He wants to do. I want to be there when He does it so we can set up another pillar and say, hey, you're not going to believe what God did here. But the point of the pillar is proof that God did it. Somebody's got to go tell them so that they go and look and check for the proof. So many people will never open this up and read it because our lives don't give them enough desire to say, well, I want proof of what they said. A lot of people think they know what the Bible says. Very few actually know what God said. They may know what their version says. They may know what somebody's told them. But if it doesn't line up with this, the only way you're going to convince them is to get them in this. Well, they're not even going to want to look if your life goes contrary to everything that you've spouted or everything that you claim your belief. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.